Hello, my friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. I hope you guys are doing well. We're going to start off looking at this as strange sounds. A new seismic map of North America reveals a highly stressed continent. And a couple of you guys out there sent me Mary Greeley's latest talking about all the activity at Yellowstone, the lifting and deformation that's going on. Of course, we have you know record activity over at the geysers. There are, there's just a lot of change going on, a real lot of change going on all around the globe. And when we take a look at this article, we see scientists have compiled the most comprehensive map yet of tectonic stress magnitudes across North America, highlighting regions most vulnerable to earthquakes. So it, real, it reveals that we're under great stresses here in North America. According to the authors, it's the first comprehensive view of the relative principal stress magnitudes throughout North America. Interesting how we're getting all of these new mappings as we just recently had the most complete mapping of the moon done. And so the new map incorporates thousands of horizontal stress orientations revealing the directionality of high pressure zones within the continent's crust. This allowed them to pinpoint seismic hotspots across North America. And a couple of these could really uh, surprise you as well. And the new map highlights previously known earthquake risks, especially in California, New Mexico, and Texas. But, you know, not everybody realizes the risks of, say, Texas for earthquakes. So that we have seen uh, a lot of increase over towards El Paso, you know, western Texas. And, of course, we have a lot of fracking going on over there as well as so many other areas across the country. Oklahoma, you you know what that's all about. You know, if you were looking at quake activity in Oklahoma from, say, 50, 60, 70 years ago, it's nothing like it is now. And there's just so much fracking going on. So to create the map, the researchers amassed over 2,000 stress orientations taken across North America, of which 300 are brand new. And these measurements were taken from boreholes, long, narrow shafts drilled into the ground for geophysical analysis. And when we see the stressors, you know, over here in Southern California, I don't think that surprises anybody to see all uh, the black lines, which, which are the lines where they have the greatest maximal stresses going on. You can see the lines over here through the fracking zone now in Oklahoma. And then we see lines going through Utah and Colorado up through here, as well as uh, through north central Colorado, as we see some stressors going on here uh, on the borders and going through Al uh, Alberta and also the very easternmost reaches of British Columbia. But, you know, this is no surprise down here. Uh, I think it's more of a question mark of what scenario is going to happen. There's a couple of different scenarios, and in case you guys have never heard of it, you know, there is the line of thought that L.A. at some point in time might be farther north than San Francisco. Yeah, <laughs> if, you know, the cities make it that long. Um, and we don't know when the San Andreas is going to go. We really, really don't. With the Garlock Fault in action now, it really changes everything, and the Garlock Fault uh, basically cuts across and is, is pushing on the San Andreas now that it's been awakened since the Ridgecrest quakes. So very interesting. You can see over here towards Mammoth Lakes, a uh, super volcanic a area as well, uh, stressors there. And then how many people realize the stress going on at the Texas-New Mexico border at the very southeastern point of New Mexico over by El Paso? Because we will see uh, quake activity there, too. And over here, too. So there's quite a bit of activity going on. How about this patch over in Pennsylvania? Now, when you look at the colors on the map, they tell you what type of stress. So bluish areas experience normal faulting where the crust stretches horizontally. So when you look at the bluish colors, that's when you have that horizontal stretch. Greenish-yellow areas experience strike-slip faulting, vertical fractures where blocks mostly move horizontally. Those are your greenish-yellow areas, as we see through here, and in many other zones as well. 
And then the reddish areas experience reverse faulting, where the fractures move on top of each other. And we see, you know, red over here, mostly on the, on the eastern seaboard area. And also a little bit of red down here in Washington and up in Alaska. And then also in this map, they have a link. So to uh, the six major areas to be aware of. And uh, here you see from lowest hazard, uh, and you go on up the color code towards the highest hazard. So obviously, you know, New Madrid over here, Alaska, Charleston area, South uh, Carolina, and then the border of uh, Western North Carolina, Eastern Tennessee as well. Of course, Hawaii is definitely at risk. California, all up the West Coast. And then also in through <laughs> uh, the border with Nevada and California, which at some point there might be water lapping at, the, uh, at some areas in Nevada even. There is the line of thought that we can have a fracture that's going to cause the Gulf of California to go all the way up to Reno. And we actually, interestingly enough, have a lot of legends from Native Americans saying that there was an inland California sea even maybe 500 years ago or less. And there again, that gets into our hidden history. So what are the six most dangerous fault lines? Number one, Cascadia subduction zone. This is the big one that we've been watching. And, you know, when Lewis and Clark got there, it had been 105 years, back in 1700, the Cascadia subduction zone last ruptured. And we're thinking it was like a 9.0 that caused a mega tsunami. So, yeah, that's big. That is big. And then we have the New Madrid seismic zone, which would affect a lot, a lot of the country. And, you know, X marks the spot the first time I saw the two eclipses. The one that we had in August 2017, the one that's coming in 2024, <clears throat> I immediately thought that's a sign that by the time the second eclipse is done, uh, the new Madrid will go. And it's interesting enough that where they cross is right at the new Madrid. Is that just a coincidence? Or is that God or whatever you want to word it giving us a sign? Very interesting. So the New Madrid seismic zone it goes across southeastern Missouri, northeastern Arkansas, western Tennessee, western Kentucky, southern Illinois. It's the most active earthquake zone east of the Rocky Mountains. And in a two-year period, uh, it experienced some of the largest quakes in history, period, ringing church bells in Boston. Can you believe that? And they felt shaking in the White House when it went. So that's a big one. And then we have the Ramapo seismic zone, which is actually Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York. So be aware of that. And that won't give us probably a 7 or anything, 8.0. But in that area, you know, getting something mid-fives towards a 6 can be uh, shocking and also very destructive. And uh, one of the... Made one of the faults in the Ramapo system even crosses New York City at about 125th Street. Then we have the Hayward Fault in California. Very, very unstable. Can produce between a 7.0 and an 8.0. We have the Denali Fault System up in Alaska. That's uh, super powerful for sure. And we had the Great uh, 64 Quake as well up that way. And then we have the San Andreas, which everybody is aware of as well. Now, you know, looking at what we've been seeing, we see more of the same as far as these swarms out west. I mean, you could, you know, you could see these interesting lines. Like, there's this curve that will come over through here. Here we see Ridgecrest. You see a lot of activity going on in the San Andreas area. Uh, we have Ridgecrest right here. And then you have this line that goes right on up towards Yellowstone. And there is the plume that feeds that does come from uh, basically, you know, around the Baja California area and rides all the way on up through to that uh, area up there at Yellowstone. So when we're looking at the swarms, we still got a swarm. We got 15 over at Salt Lake City. 
as you see, Idaho, obviously, still going on. 22 over there. Activity is still going on there. We see activity around Yellowstone itself, and this is not showing all of them. Uh, we have over here Mammoth Lakes area. We still have some activity through this whole area here. 21 between Mammoth Lakes going on up to the area east of Mono Lake as well. The geysers area has some activity going here as well. We see 14 right there, and of course in Ridgecrest. Something tells me the uh, western coast is going to get redone a bit. It's going to be a little rocking and rolling. Because it, it's going to go from west, the energy will then start to head east. And, you know, let's pray for all of us that Yellowstone doesn't really go in our lifetime. And so we have severe thunderstorms uh, that hit northern Vietnam, da damaging nearly 6,000 homes, killing three. Tremendous hail as well. And uh, we saw the same type of storms. Uh, it, you know, we're seeing them on a daily basis. You know, plain and simple. Intense storm leaves 24 dead and missing. This is in Angola. You know, of course, the whole world is still uh, fighting this plague upon the land. Intense hailstorm destroys hundreds of homes in Nagaland, India. Nagaland, India. Keyword Naga. So in the Nagas are the half serpentine, half human beings of folklore that are thought of as being wise but potentially dangerous and also are supposed to be uh, in many cases the sires of some humanoid people and some humans we should just say humans homo sapiens of sorts uh, and what's interesting is in this area these people claim that they are offspring of these mythical beings and so this is in India as well Widespread flooding hits Djibouti after more than six months worth of rain in just several hours, you know, but this is the world we have now. This is what we got going. And uh, unfortunately, I think we're kind of getting used to it, but everything is mounting up. And northern China, unprecedented spring blizzards traps people in their cars and home. There's videos, as always. I'll give you guys the links. Well... You know, they say that uh, 85 degrees wipes out the plague that is upon our land. And uh, I wonder what level of cold would make it ineffective as well. Or perhaps just basically being out in the middle of nowhere is the best bet. I think that is the best bet, honestly. Uh, Bone-chilling cold sweeps northern Russia. Records in the 50s and 60s are falling. And we have yet another asteroid that's going to fly by Earth at just over half a lunar distance on the 24th. So that will be buzzing by. It's the 31st known to fly by Earth within a lunar distance. And there's obviously a huge difference between a lunar distance and a and a astronomical unit. An astronomical unit is, you know, Earth to the Sun, which is roughly 65 million miles. And, you know, lunar distance is, you know, nowhere near that. So a lot of times when we see these sensationalist claims, you know, killer asteroid coming, da 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 and then it ends up it's passing like, you know, half uh, astronomical unit away that's like, yeah, that's nothing to worry about at all. But we do have those that come within a lunar distance, which is much more uh, cause for keeping an eye on things. And the world's largest iceberg may have just begun its death march. I remember when this thing came off. It's uh, iceberg A68, large enough to hold New York City five times over on top of it. And it's cracking up to pieces now. I, you know, I remember my mom snipped out the article and mailed it to me, snail mail, thinking I would want to know about it, uh, which was cute, you know, because obviously we have the Internet. And that was It broke off back in 2017. And uh, it is breaking up and, and disintegrating now. So we have first interstellar asteroid population discovered. And a new study has identified this first known permanent set of asteroids originating from outside our solar system. They are believed to be captured from other stars billions of years ago orbiting the sun in disguise ever since. And so, you know, we, we had Oumuamua, which was our first interstellar visitor that, that, you know, in our times that was acknowledged as such. 
So these interstellar asteroids are a population of space objects called centaurs. Everything goes back to mythology, guys. You've got to study our mythology. And uh, they may have been orbiting another star billions of years ago when the stars were nearer each other. And um, it's interesting because, you know, e galaxies even kick out stars on a regular, on a regular uh, pattern. So the thought of an interstellar visitor shouldn't really surprise us. Even perhaps, uh, you know, uh, a whole system perhaps coming in and, you know, not being from here originally, not being part of our, our local neighborhood for a long period of time. It should not really surprise us because these things do happen. And over here we see USF marine scientists complete their first gulf-wide survey of oil pollution 10 years after Deep Horizon. And it's not good. You know, it's not good at all. You know, the, the amount of pollution that is on the planet, the die-off, I mean, we are in a mass extinction of which so much of it is really man-made. And it, it is really, you know, I'll, I'll put the blame first on the corporations and the system because it's one of profits at the expense of everything. And, you know, then also the nativity of the populace, you know, the masses that just don't know what's going on. And unfortunately, unless it affects them directly in a way that, you know, seriously impacts them directly, most people don't, don't seem to care or they don't care enough to actually do anything about it, to speak up about it, or to even get out there and protest about it. And the corporations are destroying the planet. They're destroying uh, everything that lives on it. It's, it's just atrocious. Um, Cindy and I are no longer really flesh eaters. And um, I've had most of the last 20 years, you know, been vegetarian for me. And there are more than one reason for that. Because when they look at the sea life, it, it's all polluted and toxic. And then we have Fukushima, same thing, you know. So part of it is just self-preservation. Part of it is um, ethical, religious, uh, orientated as well, you know, spiritual orientated. But, you know, it's just so sad when they, when they studied the populations that were affected by this, you know, they, they, their study represented 91 species from 91 sites. Okay, that's an interesting choice. 91 species, 91 sites. 9 plus 1 equals 10 equals 1. So that's, you know, starting something new. They have found oil exposure in all of the samples, including some of the most popular types of seafood. In particular, highest levels were found in tuna, yellowfin tuna, golden tilefish, and red drum. But all of them had oil in them, petroleum products in them. And then, you know, well, we know just from overexposure to certain plastics, it could create an estrogen imbalance, which can create uh, an environment for cancer. So you got to ask yourself, you know, when, uh, when is enough enough and when do people wake up? Let's hope it's sooner than later because there won't be any later if we wait too much longer. Uh, mysterious pneumonia illness is killing thousands of birds in Germany in the last two weeks. And scientists try to figure out where that came from. There's been so many mass die-offs there. These cute little guys dropping by the thousands. That's just another sad case. And then we have, obviously, what's you know all across the globe, sparking famine of biblical proportions. In addition to the uh, earth changes and everything else going on, the pollution going on, so, you know, it is obviously the perfect storm. You know, how much of it's been orchestrated, how much of it's been done through negligence and just unfortunately not enough people caring to delve in deeper and to speak up enough and to demand change. So we really, really need to demand change. And let's send our, our prayers to all the people of the world because... This is citing certain areas in Africa, for instance, uh, the Congo and Sudan, and uh, you know, also over into Syria and Afghanistan, uh, Yemen, Haiti. You know, some of it's war-related as well. 
truly, truly, <clears throat> it's, it's a horrible situation that we see and we need absolute change. The system must go. That's just the bottom line because if the system stays or it gets worse, then, you know, we're going to be looking at what the Georgia Guidestones predicted and saying, you know, even if we hit that number that, uh, well, at least that many people made it because it really is, uh, it's a perfect storm that we're facing. 10 solar gadgets for preppers, an optic fighter starter. That could be pretty handy. A solar shower. Nice, very nice. We do have a solar water heater that we got as a gift from uh, one of the EA family, and that was beautiful, and thank you so much for that. Solar uh, powered battery, solar air lantern, multifunction solar flashlight, pocket light, solar panel charger, a sun kettle. So this, this acts like a norm, normal kitchen water kettle, heating up and boiling water using solar energy. Looks like a thermos, but with side panels that open up to catch the sun's rays, the kettle's casing is made of durable plastic, tempered glass, so it can withstand the most intense heat. And so it can be very effective. And then you got a solar oven as well. They actually really, really do work. And a solar generator... And so everybody, uh, it seems these days, are starting to become aware, at least to a degree, of using solar as an option. And as I've shared with you guys, we have uh, a 100-watt panel uh, and an inverter system in our camper, which has been enough uh, to keep, the, along with propane, to keep the uh, fridge going. Uh, to do our cooking, um, we, we've basically, uh, when it was cold, like dropping into the 20s, we would just basically turn the, um, one of the burners on for a while, you know, even, you know, say we're going to have some hot tea or something along those lines and just let it burn a little bit more and, um, you know, use that to heat it up a teeny bit and then just body heat and plenty of blankets and uh, it's, it's been all we really, really need. Um, I did add a 200 watt panel uh, because now, you know, the fridge comes on all the time now because now we're touching into the 90s. So the fringe is, the fridge is gonna be running. But um, even so, you know, it's it, always at 100% whenever I go check uh, the amount of power. So it's doing pretty well. Now, could we run the AC all the time on it? No, it's not going to happen. But that's why we're going to go underground, and that's why we have a, a twenty foot across, twenty five foot across, uh, ten to twelve foot deep hole that's going to be housing uh, an earth bag home. Eventually, that will get to it. Right now, we got so much other stuff going on. Uh, it's just you know a lot of things at one time. So I want to thank you guys so much for your support. Uh, on Ko-Fi and Patreon and every way that you guys do. You've kept us above uh, water while the first channel has been demonetized and I'm not going to even try to get it back as, as far as monetization um, because I'd have to remove so many videos because they, they had let us know their terms for getting your uh, monetization back. Uh, you know, the only other thought I had was I would turn the first channel possibly into all about prepping survival off grid instead of um, kind of sharing that on both channels. Um, but we are going to be doing a ton of more videos on how to live off grid and more prepping and more survival as well as we will be raising um, some egg laying chickens and growing hopefully all of our own food or at least the vast majority of it as we you know, try to turn the desert into a little paradise. And I want to thank you guys, as always, for being part of our family. God bless and namaste.